welcome to the second webinar on our series on AI governance brought to you by the UCLA Law Review and the UCLA Institute for Technology Law and Policy. I'm Alessia Zernetta, I'm an SJD candidate at UCLA Law and a researcher with uh, the Institute for Technology Law and Policy. Uh, I will begin by acknowledging UCLA's presence on tra the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielina and Tongue of peoples. Today, we're delighted uh, to be joined by four authors from our upcoming UCLA Law Review Discourse Essay on AI Governance. Daniel Lufler, Senior Policy Analyst, Access Now. Fanny Hitvegi, Europe Policy and Advocacy Director with Access Now. Vidushi Marda, a lawyer and independent researcher on artificial intelligence and human rights. And Michael Karen Nicholas, who is the Executive Director of the UCLA Institute for Technology Law and Policy. So, um, the authors will give a brief introduction on their paper and then we're hoping to set aside some time uh, for audience questions. So please uh, place your questions and comments into the chat as they come up. And I'll give the floor to maybe Daniel and Fanny, if you wanna start, floor is yours. Uh, sure, I, I don't know, maybe Michael, you want to give a framing a bit of, of the series for maybe for those who are joining for the first time, I'm not sure. And then we can jump in to explain our paper or what, whatever. Sure. whatever. Sure, we don't, we don't, we don't need to introduce much on, on the series as, as, as a okay. whole, um, just because it, it, it offers a comparative um, background of different approaches to AI regulation. That's an incredibly broad topic. Um, and so we wanted to get authors that are approaching the topic from um, as many different um, perspectives and thematic lenses as possible. Um, Fanny and Daniel uh, have a wonderful contribution on um, risks versus harms um, uh, in the European and the EU AI Act, which has been a huge topic of conversation. I know in the, the circles that I'm in, uh, I'm sure more so in the circles that you're in, Daniel and Fanny. And um, yeah, I'm, I'd, I'd be keen to hear more about your paper. Sure, Dania, if you don't mind, I'll just give a very short intro and then I'll hand it over to you. Uh, Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, it's 6 p.m. our time in Brussels. Um, for those who don't know what and who access now is, maybe it's useful for you to place where this paper is coming from, to know that access now is an international organization, we are an NGO, a nonprofit, and uh, our mission is to defend and extend uh, the rights of, uh, of uh, people and communities at risk. And we work at the intersection of human rights and technology. And within that structure, Danielle and I sit in Brussels. And even though that is, I think, a dirty word, we are proudly, we are lobbyists in Brussels. We are lobbying for the public interest and, and human rights. And so this paper, we, we do have a agenda to get across, which is, which is to ensure that European legislation is based on fundamental rights and, and rights more broadly. And we observed a trend in European policymaking in recent years uh, that institutions and industry is trying to rewrite history a little bit. And there is a claim that European digital policy is and should be based on the risks technology poses as opposed to, as opposed to horizontally, horizontally applicable fundamental rights uh, obligations and, and, um, and responsibilities. And one of the key legislation in the past few years was about data protection and the general data protection regulation, if you if you are familiar with it, which is a very strictly rights-based legislation. Uh, it has principles and obligations that applies across all sectors. And um, when the AI Act was launched, the European Commission reframed that data protection legislation and try to be very industry friendly to say that, don't worry, we will not stifle innovation. We will regulate AI in a way that the most minimalistic level of obligations will apply to you. And that was the starting point for the paper. Um, 
And I would give the floor to Daniel to tell us how that played out in the AI Act with the caveat that we don't have an AI Act yet. We are in the midst of the legislative process, but just beyond a huge milestone when the European Parliament adopted its negotiation position, at least in committee, and they will kick off the intra-institutional discussion, which is called trilogue in Brussels. That means the member states, the commission, and the European Parliament. But again, we're still just, just in the middle of that process. Yeah, so as Fanny said, um, the AI Act is very, very strongly risk-based to the extent that it really, the, the bulk of it places requirements on a defined ex ante list of high-risk AI systems. There's also some scope for prohibiting AI use cases that are incompatible with human rights. Uh, and then there's some transparency obligations for systems that could pose a risk of manipulation like chatbots, which became very relevant with the release of ChatGPT, uh, deepfakes, so AI generated images, etc. But the the bulk of the AI Act, as I said, is really focused on this list of high risk systems. But from the beginning, we were pointing out that, you know, there's a huge problem with defining what's high risk beforehand. Uh, and if you only apply transparency obligations, uh, risk management, et cetera, to things that have already been identified as high risk, there's a, a good chance that other things are slipping under the radar. And then you have fewer tools to find out that actually this other system is posing a big risk. So we've been critical about that system now within the AI Act, there's scope for updating that list of high risk use cases. Um, but it's a very convoluted uh, EU process called a, a delegated act that uh, I think I'm going to be involved in a lot in the coming years. And I've been warned that it's not a very enjoyable process um, or one that's very open or accessible to, to stakeholders and, and people who are affected by these systems. So we made some recommendations for how the risk-based approach, you know, could be improved. I think it's important to maybe say that in the context of EU policy making, you sort of have to make a decision of like, even if a law isn't perfect, do you engage with it and try and make it better? Um, and that was something that I think civil society and had to have a conversation about early on that when we saw the AI Act, it's product safety legislation rather than a really human rights focused one. And do you decide to make it as less bad as you can? <laughs> or do you, you know, take a more principled stand and, and not engage? But we've been working very hard with partners to get amendments in there so that it, it includes better protections for people's rights. But um, beyond those details about how the AI Act itself, you know, looks in terms of its risk-based approach, our paper really tries to argue that what we should be doing with regulation is not taking this risk-based approach. What we should be doing is empowering people, giving people rights, you know, rights to access to inf to information, uh, rights as data subjects, and making sure that people's human rights are actually, um, you know, that they can really exercise them, that they have good, clear mechanisms to do that. Uh, and if we focus on that, then we're really empowering people and it's maybe a more effective, better way to look at how um, you know, mitigate the harms, the potential harms of AI. Um, I think we'll we'll stop there, and you know, the other aspects of our paper will come up in the questions. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, um, Michael. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, thanks so much. Um, normally, I say like thank you to the to the ITLP for for providing me this venue, but um, uh, I guess that's a bit redundant. Um, so, uh, you know, when I was in law school, um, we learned about the Westphalian system of, of, of international order, right? And uh, one of the core principles of that was this idea that um, all states are equal. Um, but, you know, when I, got out, when I got out of school and started, started working, um, you know, I, I, I very quickly found out that um, in, in practical terms, 
um, some states end up being more equal than others, right? And that is um, particularly true when it comes to questions of internet governance, right? Um, partly that's because on the internet functions uh, often as an effectively borderless place or harmonization of rules is particularly valuable, right? <clears throat> so um, if, different, if, if different countries have different approaches to speed limits or voting eligibility, um, there is a very limited effect that that has across borders. But if you have 193 different approaches to privacy legislation, right, that's gonna create problems when you try to set up an online platform. Um, and that, that doesn't, obviously countries still have the ability to, 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 to regulate um, privacy questions or internet governance questions themselves, um, but there's going to be an increasing amount of pressure in, in the internet context um, to harmonize rules with um, more powerful blocks um, that are out there. This phenomenon we call um, uh, regulatory diffusion. I mean, we talk about um, the Brussels effect, right? Here in the US, we talk about the California effect, um, and it, it's driven by various different factors. Um, sometimes countries are just going to want to save resources. So if you have a perfectly good framework that's already been developed with a ton of resources put into it um, by a, a, a powerful country and it seems like it's gaining international momentum, well, you may as well sign up to it and, and save yourself the challenge of developing something new. Um, it can also help to build legitimacy if you're an emerging democracy to, to copy um, uh, frameworks that reflect democratic values by more established democracies. Um, and there are also uh, active efforts to export legislative models um, by, by countries that, that, that want to hold that level of influence. So my paper looks at um, emerging transnational frameworks uh, that are emerging for AI with particular regard to the, to the big three players that are, that are um, becoming dominant in the space. And that's the, the EU, as we, we just heard about, um, the US uh, and China. Um, in the US, uh, the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights and the AI Risk Management uh, uh, recently came out. Um, uh, and there's also been an AI Risk Management Framework um, uh, put forward by uh, uh, NIST. Um, uh, and then uh, there's been state level initiatives as well in places like California, Texas, Connecticut, and Illinois. Um, and there's also been uh, a basket of regulations that have put, been put forward in China by the Cyberspace Administration of China, the China Academy of Information and Communications Technology, and the Ministry of Science and Technology. These are not, the, these three big regulatory kind of movements are not the only, they're not the only game in town. Um, Canada's directive on automated decision-making has been enforced for a while. Um, Singapore has been trying to define itself in this space. Um, and the OECD has also been driving its own process um, uh, to develop uh, AI principles. Um, but all of these are driven from a developed world perspective, um, particularly through their understandings of how challenges related to AI should be framed, right? There's a focus on fairness to subjects of um, decisions and ideas like explainability, right? There's a focus on mitigating bias. There's a focus on protecting privacy, right? And, and th these are good areas to focus on, but there's a lot that gets missing. And I would argue that that's based on the fact that these are all emanating from a particular developed world context. So for example, um, equity and development challenges related to global AI supply chains don't tend to come up very much uh, in, these, in these conversations. Environmental challenges related to the energy um, uh, used to, to drive, uh, to develop AI models, as well as the extractive processes to um, to, to, develop, to develop the hardware associated with them. Labor challenges related to exploitation and, and, and workforces. Um, all, these, the, all, the, all these aspects of, of the, the problem don't really um, come up. And, and I would argue that that's because um, a lot of them tend to be clustered um, in the global south and the majority world. Um, and these are, these are processes that are driven from a developed world um, mentality. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, as a result of that, you know, my paper points to this tension where you have these regulations that are meant to guard against harms related to AI's potential to replicate and entrench traditional biases and equities and discrimination within the side, societies where they've been developed. Um, but they sort of try to address them by um, creating a global system which reflects traditional colonial inequities um, and oppression. Um, and you know, this isn't an argument against these regulatory initiatives, but it just it just is intended to flag challenges and in how they get exported. 
Um, and, you know, so I, I conclude by trying to think of um, particular um, avenues forward. You know, there have been arguments made for a multi-stakeholder, a more inclusive um, global approach. Um, you know, that's a step forward, I think, from the current system. Um, but ultimately, there are always going to be challenges or a tension between the advantages of a global and harmonized system um, and the tendency of any such system to, to skim over valuable local context in the process. Um, so that's the tension that I explore in my paper, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to, to chatting further about it. Great, thank you. Uh, Vidushi, do you want to give your introduction? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so my paper focuses on what I consider one of the most understudied or under discussed aspects of AI regulation at the moment. Um, and it looks at the specific trend of relegating important aspects of AI regulation to technical standards bodies. Um, and this is happening in multiple jurisdictions, but my paper focuses mainly um, on the EU uh, in the EU context, mostly because it's the most mature kind of AI regulatory policy window that we have at the moment. Um, and so essentially, for those who are not very familiar, under the EU's um, AI Act, you have obviously, as Fanny and uh, Danielle have laid out, you have different classifications of risk. So one of the classification is high-risk systems, which includes um, systems used you know, in recruitment, in education, in law enforcement, um, for the provision of welfare um, benefits and services so on and so forth. Um, and if someone, if providers want to, you know, um, bring these systems to the market, they have to show that these particular AI systems conform with essential requirements, which is a term of art um, in EU law. They have to conform with the essential requirements laid down under, under the Act. Um, now, the Act is quite complex and quite vague in how it defines essential requirements, and, and it has multiple essential requirements laid down. Um, and so it would be theoretically quite complex and expensive for providers to show that they do comply with these essential requirements. Like Luckily for them, there's a second route um, by which providers just have to show that they comply with harmonized standards that are laid down by technical bodies, technical standardization bodies, such as SEN and Senelec in the EU. Right. So long story short, if you are a provider of a high risk system, either you go through the essential requirements of the act or you just show that you comply with a particular standard. Um, now, the complication arises when we consider what standards bodies have traditionally done. Standards bodies, um, you know, they've come up with standards for light switches, so we don't get electrocuted by them. They come up with standards for seat belts, so we're safe when we're, uh, you know, driving and sitting in cars. Um, it comes up with standards like Wi-Fi that allow us to connect devices to one another, but they are traditionally focused more, more so on safety and robustness, but they do not have the technical, uh, legal, and definitely not the human rights capacity to properly identify social technical aspects of technology, um, such as the ones that AI systems pose. So Sen and Senelec specifically, which are the technical standardization bodies in the EU, um, are historically known to be you know, made up mostly of engineers, mostly of technical experts. They don't have the human rights ex expertise um, one of the most popular kind of counters uh, to that is to say, well, just bring civil society into the room. And once you have human rights experts in the room, you know, the problem is solved. And my paper actually says that, well, unless we solve the institutions within which the standardization happens, unless we make these institutions um, more accountable, more transparent, um, unless we make the culture of these institu institutions such that it's not just the technical kind of considerations that are given prominence, um, but also that we look at human rights considerations carefully. And also we reckon with the fact that AI systems and the human rights impacts that they kind of pose are posed in context. And so maybe, you know, a high risk AI system shouldn't be standardized and shouldn't be scaled in the way that technical standards bodies would want. Um, those are the kinds of considerations that I think we need to be thinking about at this moment. Um, unfortunately, I think that this is not necessarily an area or an aspect of the EU AI Act that has gotten enough time either within the parliament or in, you know, um, general discourse and narratives. Um, because at the very last minute, I think just before the vote um, last week, um, the the requirement to exclude fundamental rights from the remit of these technical standardization bodies was removed by parliament. Um, and so we're really looking at a situation in which 
theoretically, some of the most important aspects of the EU AI Act that as um, they relate to fundamental rights are going to be decided and kind of defined by technical standardization bodies. Um, and again, just to underscore, just having civil society in the room is actually quite dangerous because in the past we've seen when civil society is in a room without any real power, we run the risk of rubber stamping really problematic practices. But to say, you know, but civil society was in the room. It's not like we didn't listen to them, even if, um, you know, in reality and in practice, there was no real power given to um, those representing the public interest and fundamental rights considerations. Um, so I'll pause there and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, all three very interesting uh, insights. Maybe I can get started with uh, a question for uh, Michael, but then feel free to also jump in if you have uh, any comments. Uh, I was wondering if you could maybe discuss what are the benefits and risks of uh, the so-called spillover effect of legislation such as the EU or the California one or other frameworks arising in the three main blocks and what happens if we replicate them elsewhere? Yeah, I'd, I'd be very interested in hearing from the other panelists on this, but, but I'm happy to kick it off. Um, so in terms of the benefits of uh the, the the this sort of osmosis of of, of laws or or um uh the, the the transnational impact of this legislation um i would say that you know it's better than nothing and especially insofar as a lot of the time um these legislative approaches get copied in in a bit of a i don't want to say a vacuum but in in a, in a legislative context where um there's not a lot of um domestic energy um, towards, or, or there's not a lot of formal legislative energy towards developing a new framework, right? And, and I would say that was true. Um, so I think my introduction to this phenomenon was in the right to information space, where there was um, a really energetic um, effort to export particular models of legislation um, between like uh, the early 2000s to the, you know, 2010s, or at least that that's, you know, the, the time frame that I'm more familiar with. Um, and one of the benefits of it, um, at least in that context, was um, that this pressure to export models of legislation um, was um, driving governments to adopt laws where otherwise they probably just would ignore the issue, right? Um, and so, so I thought, especially with something like right to information, like that was positive because it's, it's good for a country to have a right to information law on the books, right? There's benefits to it. Um, and it's pushing something where otherwise you might not get um, legislative outcomes. Um, the flip side to that um, is that there are always gonna be contextual challenges. Um, and I think that that's particularly pronounced when you have something like AI regulation, which is so important and impacts so many different areas of, of the economy and human rights. Um, to take one example, so the last draft of the AI Act that I read, which is certainly gonna be out of date by now, um, but uh, I, I recall that there were prohibitions in the AI Act against real-time, against the use of these technologies for real-time biometric um, identification. But these prohibitions were subject to limited exceptions based on public safety threats, right? Now, you know, you can argue about that, about that exception, but it has a particular meaning in a place like uh, France or Germany um, where there's um, a, a reasonable um, level of, of democratic um, development, there's, there's strong democratic safeguards, um, as well as there's, there's a presumption of kind of underlying stability. Um, so you see like broad public safety threats as something that's gonna be exceptional. Um, if you export that same rule to somewhere like Myanmar or Pakistan or Nigeria, um, the context is gonna be completely different and it's gonna be right for abuse because you don't have the same level of democratic development um, democratic stability or underlying um, security um, stability that'll that'll uh, allow an exception like that to be phrased properly. Um, so I don't know if that exception is still there, um, uh, and I and I and I'm not taking a position of the wisdom um, or otherwise of it within the EU AI Act. Um, but it's a good example of a situation where um, you know if you have um, countries just copying the rules that are that are put in place elsewhere, they can have very different meanings um, because the underlying context changes. 
Great, thank you. Anybody wants to comment on this as well? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we talk about as well in our paper is how the AI Act is very much framed as something that's building on top of existing EU regulation, like the GDPR. Uh, and the GDPR offers a lot of protections in the context of AI, as we've seen with the Italian Data Protection Authority's investigation into ChatGPT, for example, um, and more investigations that are GDPR based into generative AI systems. And there's a real danger that the AI Act would be copied in a jurisdiction that doesn't have a robust data protection regulation. Because it's it's all the time assume you know when we've had conversations with the commission, or our member states or the parliament, about certain safeguards, they have often come back with oh but the GDPR covers that or oh the Digital Services Act covers that so we don't need to do that in the AI Act. But as Michael said, like if if you bring that to a jurisdiction where there isn't that those things don't exist and there isn't an appetite to do data protection because it's a lot less sexy. <laughs> than AI, um, you're going to run into real gaps. Um, you know, so so that's definitely one, one big problem. Another big problem is, um, as I mentioned before, only that high risk list of high risk AI systems is possible to update in the AI Act. And that's really strange because AI, as everyone knows, and the classic cliche for every single article about AI is that it's a fast moving domain. Why would you have a closed list for the most dangerous practices? So the list of prohibited practices cannot be updated after adoption without reopening the entire law. But we know that things could come on the market, uh, capabilities could be developed that very clearly present an unacceptable risk to people's rights. There'd be no scope within the AI Act for it to kind of adapt to that and, and prohibit things. And in terms of, um, you know, the, it being copied in other places, you also have the problem that other states will say, oh, those are the four things that need to be prohibited and that's it and everything else is fine. And we've seen that already. Brazil has uh, a draft AI law as well, which I have not been following in the... Uh, you know, seeing the, the latest version or anything, but the last version that I saw had the same four prohibitions, more or less, as the AI Act. So we'll see that copy pasted into other jurisdictions. Um, now, Brazil does have a GDPR-like regulation, so so there maybe it's, it's not as much of an issue, but we definitely will see this also because I think given the amount of hype, the amount of media attention around AI, there's a huge pressure to do some kind of AI regulation, um, but that could really leave these more, arguably much more important, basic fundamental things, which, you know, from our perspective as well, are really like rights-based approaches, uh, won't get done. And this risk-based approach will be what happens. And if I may, open up the original question even more broadly. I think there's a fundamental dilemma for many of us operating, let's say, in the European Union, but in an international context that obviously we would like to use the more or less democratic context of some of the EU countries, but not all of them, and not the European Commission itself is very respectful of some fundamental rights. And we would like to push for the highest possible standards. At the same time, we understand this norm export as a form of neocolonialism, you know, and this is, and and we would definitely not advocate for that norm expansion without respect for local context and 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 experiences and everything. Um, at the same time, we have to use the existing avenues we have in a regional structure like the European Union to hold them accountable to human rights standards. And I know this is beyond this panel, but we have discussions even about the human rights system as something that is no longer an answer to some of the some of the harms and violations and challenges on a community on a group level 
the human rights system is extremely individualized and many aspects of AI and even big data, you know, we don't have to call it AI all the time. Um, even, even, even data protection has a really strong idea around what happens when it's a big set of data, not about you or your data impacting someone else overall. And the individualized human rights framework doesn't always have a response to those questions, but we still have to use what we have um, in these, well, reformist reforms, so to say. Thank you. These were all very interesting insights and important remarks, I would say. Maybe uh, still related to this somehow, but um, in uh, almost all the presentations, we heard um, that there is a need to have some sort of meaningful public consultation process. So I was wondering if maybe Fanny and Daniel or Vidushi, if you want to talk about uh, what does a meaningful public consultation look like uh, and what what is missing from what's currently being done? Um, so I could jump in first, maybe. Um, I think, you know, Vidushi and, and myself are very much involved in the weeds of the negotiation process on the AI Act. And uh, we've seen, you know, there, there's a lot to um, improve in terms of how public consultation has been done there. Um, one thing that, you know, the entire EU process of, you know, getting a law on the table and negotiating it between the co-legislators is extremely complex. It's very difficult to explain to the general public. There are public consultation moments. Uh, you know, the Commission will do these consultations, but they're often quite hard to do. The questions can be very opaque. So while there are things that look like public consultation, it's far from any kind of an ideal of really getting getting input here. And I think in the context of the AI Act negotiations, we have been successful in getting real input in. And when I say we here, I'm using a broader we than, than access now, because very early on, um, when, the, when the AI Act came out, we realized that we're really going to need coalition work here because it's not just a digital rights issue. Um, so many of these issues impact things like disability rights, the rights of migrants, refugees, undocumented people, etc. And there was a risk that we saw that you'd have every individual group, stakeholder group, trying to comment on everything and not managing to do it at the right level of depth. And so we very quickly set about trying to build a coalition and thanks to some really excellent work that was done by Sarah Chander from European Digital Rights, which is a network organization of digital rights organizations in Europe uh, who have been working with the Digital Freedom Fund and some other organizations on a decolonizing digital rights um, initiative where they've made contact with groups like representing sex workers rights, representing people with disability rights, everyone, we, there was already a community that was much broader than the typical digital rights community. Um, and multiple organizations, including, you know, people like Fiduci and other people really worked together to make sure that those voices, like the voice representing uh, undocumented people, uh, refugees, etc., was promoted as much as possible in the debate but um it's not an, an easy thing to do and it would definitely be better if that you know getting that input was more formalized was more accessible and didn't rely on the initiative of civil society to make itself heard by shouting very loudly and you know doing all sorts of complex maneuvers to try to get these issues on the table so there's there's definitely a huge amount of work that could be done there, and it's significant as well after the adoption of the AI Act because 
as I mentioned before, there's going to be this list of high risk systems that can be updated. Um, industry and others, <laughs> law enforcement agencies will be pushing to remove things from that list probably. And we'll have to be there providing evidence, providing arguments, public pressure to get new things added, um, to get that list expanded where it needs to be expanded. So that's going to be tricky as well um, after the act. It definitely won't be over. And, you know, the, the final thing I'll say on that is that there's a big challenge within AI to make sure that who is defined as an expert remains broad because there's a strong push from industry to, you know, like we saw this with that White House roundtable, it's a load of tech CEOs and they're the ones there who are talking about what's what's the real impact of AI. But, okay, we probably should talk to them, but we should really hear a lot of other people and um, a much broader uh, group of people, including just people who are affected by these systems. They are also experts in these systems. You know, in the Netherlands, we had this child benefit scandal where families were destroyed, people lost children, uh, people went into crazy debt because of a very misfunctioning AI system that was trying to detect fraud, uh, benefits fraud. The people who were destroyed, <laughs> their lives destroyed by that system are experts in AI. And we need to make sure that that broad like vision of what an expert is, is translated into all of these different uh, legislative processes. I just wanted to add um, one thing. I mean, I agree with everything that Daniel said, um, but but I just wanted to like encourage us to zoom out a little bit outside the EU and outside the US, um, and just kind of be mindful of the fact that in many countries, civil society doesn't even know that the room exists, let alone being invited into the room. Um, and it's often that, you know, you know that a law is in motion or you know that there is a text of a law because you read it in the newspaper, even though you work on these issues for a living. Um, and that is the exception and not the rule in the majority of the world. Um, I think for me, it's a, it's a unique experience to live in India, but work internationally because sometimes I think that the bar is too low in my head, <laughs> you know, because um, I'm I'm almost surprised that civil society is able to have this kind of impact um, in, you know, in the kind of work that they do and also have access to people in power. I mean, just reading about Sam Altman's dinner last night in DC or whatever that was on the East Coast, uh, I'm not too sure. Um, I think it, it, it also points to a very real, um, almost normalized practice of industry kind of deciding what it looks like. And that's why I appreciate the point towards meaningful public consultation, right? Because if it's meaningful, then even if things that, um, you know, certain stakeholders ask for aren't taken into account, um, you are provided justification for that. Um, and I think that's a big indicator of whether, you know, we're having the illusion of consultation or whether that, that's, you know, a give and take is actually happening. Right. Thank you. Just very briefly. Um, yeah, I, I, I think as a more general rule, um, one of the differences between meaningful, um, between, uh, between whether consultation is meaningful or consultation is treated um, like just a kind of just a box to check um, on the government side, uh, it, it relates to transparency and how feedback is incorporated or rejected. Right. I always hear complaints from folks that are that are involved in these processes and have experienced this, where like the government people come in the room and you give them a bunch of feedback and then they're like, great, I will take this back with me. And then like no information about whether you've actually impacted change, if your suggestions were incorporated, if your suggestions were rejected, if they were rejected, then why? Um, and so like just just feel that, that that that's one of the things that governments can do to make. Um, consultations feel meaningful, at least, and feel make civil society people that are involved in it feel like they're not wasting their time. Is just some some information that, like you know, that the person who you were talking to didn't just immediately leave the room and like shred all those pages of notes that they took. Because sometimes, like, there's no way of knowing if that happened or or if it actually went through the process of government and, and actually reached people who were making decisions. Um, so it, it's, it can, that, that's, I think, one practical thing that I've seen. Yeah, maybe um, thinking about, you know, this note on 
the differences between what happens in Europe and in the US and uh, in the majority of the world. I was wondering if um, any of you would want to address um, the differences between the benefits of regulating AI from a local perspective, so having local regulators dealing with it in their local uh, context, as uh, opposed to like adopting a regional or international approach to regulating AI, considering the limitations for both. Maybe Michael, do you want to start with this one? Uh, yeah, I mean, ju just very briefly, because I think I, I think I, I feel like I addressed this um, in in my first answer. Uh, and, and don't want to repeat myself. Um, uh, but I, you know, in addition to these challenges related to local contexts, um, th there are efficiencies to harmonize legislation, right? I mean, that, that's, that's a big part of the, the raison d'etre of the EU, right? Is, is harmonization um, creates economic efficiencies, right? If you're um, a tech company, and you're trying to create uh, a service that's usable by people all over the world, and it's, it's, it's easier for you, um, and, and it creates a simple and more efficient system of regulation if everybody just follows the same privacy rules. If there's just one system in place, and you can say, all right, well, he, he, here's our approach to privacy, and it's just the same everywhere, that's great. Um, if you have this patchwork of different frameworks, um, it creates inefficiencies and creates regulatory challenges, it creates regulatory uncertainty. Um, uh, uh, but of course, like the, 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 the flip side to that is you're ignoring local contexts and, you know, on privacy questions, I mean, like, you know, you can make an argument that, that companies should just give everybody the strongest protections that they give everybody the same strong protections that they do in, in stronger jurisdictions. Companies don't like that because it, it's, it's less, uh, you know, it closes off avenues of monetization. Um, but you know, that's an argument that's there. Um, on content questions, for example, it's completely different. Every different country is going to set, you know, different rules around how you define hate speech and how you define uh, defamation and how you define copyright infringement. And so like that, you know, there are inefficiencies there that lead to challenges when you're trying to deliver harmonized services and, 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 it, and it creates, you know, it, the, the lack of efficiency, you know, efficiency in regulation and efficiency in business operations is a, is fundamentally a good thing to be promoting um although it, you know it's it's one challenge um it although it's one value in a basket alongside you know human rights development and proper respect for privacy and, and, and etc anybody wants to add anything to this or i have more questions yeah, we, we don't have a huge amount of time, and I really want to hear uh, okay. Vidushi in particular on number on the next question. Okay. Um, all right. So we spoke briefly about standards and harmonization. I was wondering if Vidushi, you could maybe talk about what are the practical um, implications for uh, standards, especially if we look at how engineering teams uh, will then work with these standards. I mean, I I think uh, just taking a step back, you know, you, we've all kind of seen I, ISO standards or, you know, IEEE standards in, in different, you know, uh, technologies that we use, um, but we don't actually understand what the standard means, right? And that has been okay so far, because when you're looking at safety of toys or safety of switches or safety of seatbelts, that's fine because you just wanna make sure that it's robust, that it is you know, reliable, um, that it's safe to use. Um, but I think when we're looking at standards from a kind of like high risk AI system perspective and having studied some of the standards that will be the foundation for you know, what comes out of the EU, especially from the um, ISO, I think it's really worrying um, because if you look at the actual text of the standards and the level of detail into which they go, it's actually just completely wide open for interpretation, right? So some standards almost read like uh, an introductory textbook on fairness, but they don't actually lay down exactly what fairness looks like. And having worked in technical standardization bodies for a long time, I know that there is immense amount of frustration from the engineering side to say, you're using these words, I have no idea what they mean, I need you to be more precise. And in this context, it's funny because regulation is 
kind of doing the same thing, right? It's it's not being specific about exactly what we mean by fair or reliable or, um, you know, equitable or, you know, so on and so forth, insert um, whatever kind of word you want to do there. Um, I think the important thing is also like standards don't just operate at the level of specific jurisdictions, like ISO standards because of something called the Vienna Agreement, ISO standards form the basis of a lot of standardization bodies across the world. So we're talking regional as well as national standardization bodies that use these standards as a starting point for building their own standards within their own context. And so the diffusion, if you will, of standards, of technical standards is far, far more political than we realize. And I think what's really worrying is at the same time as it being you know, super political and super vague, um, it's also kind of just growing and, and being embedded in industries and in markets really, really quietly. Um, because if, if you ask even me as someone who follows standards for a living, if you ask me to name like five standards and what the main points of each of those standards are, I wouldn't be able to tell you because A, you have to pay to access those standards. Um, B, standards are extremely complex documents that not only lay down frameworks, but also requirements um, you know, technical tests, so on and so forth, they don't lend themselves to um, public deliberation in the way that we would need, especially when it comes to high-risk systems. So I think the, um, the practical implementation is really a huge question. And the last thing I'll say is, um, you know, having spoken to people who work within Sen and Sena, like in the EU, who work on harmonized standards, a lot of them don't want to do the work of fundamental rights uh, deliberation because it is messy, it is inconvenient, it's incredibly complex, and it just isn't a good fit for, um, you know, people and groups that are used to thinking about interoperable interoperability and uh, safety. And so I think the, the point that Daniel made a little while earlier where this is like product safety legislation and we're kind of shoehorning fundamental rights into it, it's, it's an inconvenience that people working on the act face day in and day out. And I think the practical reality of it is we're definitely going to see this happen, um, especially at the time we're trying to, you know, figure out what compliance of the act actually, look, uh, actually looks like. Can I can I jump in on that just for a second because I I fully agree and I would also just add that we are trying we are trying to put everything and anything in this legislation on broad human rights protections and some of the topics lack legislative basis outside the context of AI, you know, like the EU would need to have much better protections against discrimination. And this is a great tool for us to, to help to try to fight some of these high risk applications or even unacceptable applications. But because of its nature, as we've talked about it at length, it it is not an a, it's not the real tool it's not the real solution for those problems. There was a question in the chat about uh, EU member states and the, the ability of national governments. Um, and I frankly don't have a lot of uh, faith or trust in those national efforts in most of those countries, especially based on the negotiate, negotiations with some exceptions, all we see is the usual effort to find law enforcement and national security carve-outs and claiming that when national security applies, then all of a sudden human rights disappear, which is obviously not true, but they just fight for, for all the quote-unquote sovereignty and to be able to apply the worst possible technologies at the borders or for specific law enforcement purposes. And so I don't see, I wouldn't see it as a, as a better way to rely on, on those national governments individually, even if they had some, let's say, positive outliers. Overall, I think the balance would be worse. I think we have time for uh, one more quick question. Um, I So we spoke a lot about the EU initiative, and we know that there are some initiatives in the US and in China, but uh, there are also other democratic countries that are taking uh, legislative action in the matter, like Canada and Singapore. And I was wondering 
uh, maybe Vidushi can get started on this one. Where do these initiatives fit in and what can what are the consequences for uh, all these legislative action for the majority world and what can we expect from the majority world on AI? I think we can expect many different things from the majority world. I think uh, there's no one way in which um, countries are going to respond. Uh, but a couple of thoughts, I think firstly, again, coming back to the product legislation, um, product safety legislation bit, I think that um, that framework appeals to many countries, right? That that framework of having an efficient and thriving market um, applies to many countries in a way that is much quicker, for better or for worse, um, than a fundamental rights argument alone. Um, and as we saw with the GDPR, the Brussels effect is really strong, whether we um, realize it at the moment or not. Um, in fact, I think for anyone interested in this, the Asian Business Laws Institute has this excellent handbook that analyzes what happened after the GDPR came into force. And they look at each country in Asia and say, like, this was the exact impact of the GDPR. Um, um, you know, even if it was like, we're using the text as the GDPR to begin conversations to say we accept or reject this entire premise. That is a huge, 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 um, you know, kind of lever of influence because it's it's almost like most states are not starting with a blank slate, even though, as, as we have uh, discussed here today, maybe it makes more sense to actually start within ground realities. But that is, unfortunately, I don't think that that's necessarily um, the truth of the matter. And secondly, um, at the risk of repeating myself, I think because there is this, you know, um, pretty strong requirement for standards bodies, but already seeing that after the EU, for instance, the UK is looking at standards uh, in a similar way. And that, that makes sense if you look at it in terms of like mirroring a global economy that would have to have interoperable systems. So I think it's, um, I mean, I couldn't tell you what we could expect from the majority world, but I think it's definitely um, important to realize that the EU AI Act will be a starting point um, and where countries eventually end up will determine, I mean, will be determined by their unique circumstance. All right, maybe we have time for one more um, question from the chat. So Jason is asking um, whether any of you has any thoughts on the Council of Europe draft convention on AI and how the, this draft convention will impact uh, the evolving landscape. Maybe Daniel or Penny can start on this one. I can, I can definitely um, talk. So I was following the negotiations on the Council of Europe treaty a lot when it was the ad hoc, the CAHI, the Council of Europe Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence. Now it's the Council of Europe Committee on Artificial Intelligence. So the acronym lost two letters. But um, that was, I mean, it was interesting to see the complexities of having two overlapping instruments being negotiated at the same time by the same countries, but different ministries potentially. So a lot of the ministries involved in the AI Act negotiations are ministries of economy, um, but you had ministries of justice often at the Council of Europe. So that was a bit tricky. And I, I think we were seeing how those two instruments could positively benefit each other you know they if one of them set a high bar the other one would maybe follow but that they could equally drag each other down and we actually saw that in the negotiations a couple of times so um <clears throat> within the council of europe negotiations there was a big debate about whether within a risk-based approach which they also wanted to take there would be scope for prohibitions and some member states were saying, no, if you're taking a risk-based approach, then there's no prohibitions. And then the AI Act came out with its risk-based approach with prohibitions. And then that was the end of that discussion. So that was like a positive one. But then you had, in terms of national security exemptions, you had the kind of opposite dynamic happening. And, you know, you had other participants in those negotiations um, <clears throat> pushing back really effectively against that. But um, I think in general, it's it's hard to see 
where this is going to go because the two instruments are being negotiated at the same time and there has been some complex and problematic diplomatic maneuvering um, behind the scenes, like the European Commission sort of taking the reins a little bit in terms of how your EU member states were allowed to negotiate there and uh, as well a very problematic exclusion of civil society from the drafting process um, apparently at the request of a country on the other side of the Atlantic so very tricky and you know we will see where this is going to go but um, I think there it looks like there will be a lot of overlap um, quite a similar approach despite the kind of quite different mandates and ultimately I think that's disappointing because the you know the EU went with this product safety approach whereas the Council of Europe didn't have to take that and arguably should have been able to take more of a rights-based approach and set a much higher bar um, than it seems like they might end up doing. I would very much like to hear the answer to which lobby is the most present in negotiations that you've seen. Obviously, it's big human rights is just everywhere. This this powerhouse that is constantly telling the EU what to do. Um, do, do does anybody who's been closer to these negotiations that I've been get a have a sense of, of who seems to be you know who who are the external forces that seem to be driving this? I mean, it's, it's like a joke anecdote, but it's also serious that I went to one, a briefing from the Czech presidency. So when the Czech Republic had the presidency of the of the council and they did a kind of a stakeholder briefing, it was kind of civil society, but it was civil society very broadly. So not like human rights organizations. And during the questions, I must have heard, you know, people will put up their hands and say, we're from the software alliance and then the alliance of software companies and then the company alliance of software <laughs> you know all of these different sort of shell organizations that basically all of their members were you know big tech companies um so you have a huge amount of these organizations within brussels um who you know more or less represent the same number of companies and more or less say don't regulate us um as well as the companies themselves uh, in there, so the, the tech lobby is is very, very, very present um, in negotiations for sure, but also law enforcement. Um, we know, for example, with the council that, um, you know, you can have a conversation with someone from a member state representative and they can say more or less, we agree very much with what you're saying, but unfortunately, law or national law enforcement agencies are really turning screws here and so a lot of the you know prohibitions especially impact very very dangerous contexts like law enforcement migration etc and that's where there's a huge amount of pressure precisely not to put restrictions so so that's very tricky yeah and the, the thing about law enforcement again i i haven't been involved in those negotiations but but other ones i've involved in um the thing about law enforcement influence on the process is they're they're not necessarily there in the room with you. Um, they, you know, you have a room full of people, and this the, these are the, the 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 discourse that you are exposed to is civil society engagement, and then there's a completely different consultation process that law enforcement will just use because they have direct avenues in to influence the process. Um, All right, I I think we're getting close to the end. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. Uh, I imagine you're all available to take questions uh, that were left unanswered in the chat. But in the meantime, uh, I highly invite you to join us for the third webinar in our series. Uh, it will tackle AI and the First Amendment. Uh, will take place on May 25th at noon Pacific time. And we'll have Eugene Follock, Mark Lemley, James Grumman of Cornell, and Jane Van Bauer of the University of Arizona joining us. And thanks again uh, to the panelists. It was really uh, a pleasure having you here today. Thanks all. And thank you very much, Alessia, for moderating. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.